Each day, parents are faced with tough decisions regarding their children, some innocuous and some critically very important, especially those decisions which concern their health. Today, we are delving into two hot-button health choices parents have to make that affect their kids, circumcision and the HPV vaccination. We're going to start with circumcision. What do you say? <laughs> to snip or not to snip? The American Academy of Pediatrics recently released a statement proclaiming that the benefits of circumcision outweigh the risks. Our first guests are on the opposite ends of the spectrum when it comes to circumcision. She's for it, he's against it. They took their disagreement public and stated their case to the mom.me website. Oh, and did I mention that they're about to have a baby? <laughs> and I think it's a little boy. Please welcome Laura and Ian to the show. Thank you for being here, and thank you for talking so openly about this. We're talking about circumcision. Which one of you is for it and which is against it? I'm for it. I'm against it. And I understand you have a great marriage, great relationship. This is really the one thing you disagree on. The only thing. That's it. There's the just only one. thing. There's just, there's just there's one just and we one. found it. Okay, I have to imagine there's maybe a few other things you disagree on. Maybe the paint color in the room or something like that. But okay, how far along are you? Uh, eight months today. <laughs> okay, so, and it is a boy. Okay, double checked. It's a boy. It's, it's a boy. Okay, congratulations <laughs> to you. you. So you're for it, you're against it. Why are you against it? Well, you know, when uh, my wife first brought up the subject, I had never even considered it before, really. Uh, I had been circumcised, and it was just, a, I think, an assumed thing for generations in this country. But we have a little girl, and I remember when she was first born, seeing her and, and her helplessness, and the need to protect her was so completely overwhelming. And in just a little bit of time, a little boy is going to come out and a doctor is going to hold him up by the ankle and spank well, you're him. you're getting and, a weird visual. <laughs> like <he's> yeah. like, <laughs> and take him off to perform a, a, a surgery on him, which is medically unnecessary. According to you. Some might say that it is, I mean, and I'm not saying, I'm playing both sides because it was a very difficult decision for me to make. Um, but I understand. So you think it's a barbaric procedure? No, I don't, I'm not saying it's a barbaric procedure. I'm saying my urge to protect my child, my first child, was so overwhelming that I couldn't imagine the idea that having a second one, that I would want to perform a, a surgery on it without knowing that something was really wrong. Okay, and you disagree with that? Yeah, I mean, I feel the same protective nature, obviously, as a mom. Um, but I'm looking kind of down the road. Um, I think that there are medical reasons, preventative reasons, health reasons, that are important to circumcise a little boy. So what are those reasons to you, according to you? According to me, um, well, there's the studies have shown that there's a lower risk of urinary tract infections, of um, getting a, a STDs and uh, different, uh, like HIV, STDs. And for me, uh, preventing that at birth uh, is, is more important for something that he's not going to remember anyway. Okay. Um, is this causing a lot of friction between you two? That's yes. a poor choice of words. <laughs> <laughs> Is this something you're talking about a lot? Oh, yeah. Oh, definitely. Oh, yes. We've had lots of, <laughs> oh, yes. lots of conversations. And do you have the issue that you want him to look like his daddy? I've thought about that, yeah, because, I, you know, I've had conversations with our daughter, you know, about, you know, body parts and girl parts and boy parts. And I, I'm sure naturally a child is going to look to, a son is going to look to his dad. <laughs> of course, um, and you know, wonder why, why do I look different from Daddy? What's wrong with me? I worry about that. I, I never saw my father naked. And I, <laughs> I, I hope to repeat that process. So okay, so how will you come to an agreement? I mean, one of you is going to win this argument. Uh. <laughs> It may be just a coin flip. It might just have to come down to that. Well, can, can we just go through the hour and check back with you during the show and see? Maybe you'll feel differently, when, either one of you, and we'll come to an agreement by the end of the hour? Sure. Absolutely. All right. Yeah. I don't have high hopes for that happening, but we're going to try. <laughs> Any of you, I, I don't see men close to me, but, uh, but anyone have an opinion? Well, you, sir. I know you don't want to be there. I'm not going to ask you. I'm not going to put you on the spot. Um, but what do you have to say about this issue in general? Uh, it definitely just comes down to hygiene you know, at the end of the, at the end of the day, really. Like, um, so you're saying it's some, it's it's not clean uh, when you're uncircumcised if you're intact. Well, I I wouldn't know, but um, 
Oh, so you just outed yourself, dude. <laughs> well, it's just like I said, I guess it just depends on how you take care of it. And later, like you said, later on the, down the line, you never know. But it's just, it really is a hygiene thing in my mind. In your mind? Yeah. Okay. All right. Thank you. What about women? Let's hear from women. Yes. Hi. What do you think about it? I think it's been highly promoted by religion for a lot of years. And that it's not medically necessary. I agree with the father that if he's not going to die, I mean, a, a, you know, urinary tract infection, he's not going to die from that. You know, like, and the chances of getting HIV, I hope that you teach your child to use good sex practices when it comes time. You know, so I... And good hygiene. Yeah, <laughs> good hygiene. But I, I don't think it's necessary anymore, and I think it's a practice that was promoted for a long time, that it's still done out of uh, routine and out of tradition, but it's, in other countries, it's not as practiced as it is here, and I don't think it's necessary. And it's changing here. The, yeah. the, the, you know, it's much more 50-50. I mean, we have the exact statistics coming up, but it really isn't necessarily the norm to be circumcised this country anymore. Yeah, I agree. Oh, and what about the fact that, that this little baby, and I, again, I'm just throwing it out there, this isn't necessarily my opinion, but this little baby, something is being done to his body and there's no informed consent for that little boy. Well, I mean, I think there are lots of things that we do <laughs> as parents that our children don't necessarily consent to. I mean, we vaccinate them, we've seen them cry a lot, and I would think that that's, you know, for the betterment of them, to protect them. And again, it goes back to the protective instinct. You don't want them to see them hurt as newborns or even down the road as adults, you know, and to have to go through that and, you know, to have to have that surgery as, a, as an adult or as, you know, a, a child who, who can feel that pain and feel that embarrassment later on um, is something that I think about. And, um, you know, that's, that weighs on me. And You both raise really good arguments for both cases. And coming up, we are going to have a gentleman that did get circ circumcised later in life. I believe he was 37. So we're, ooh, wow. <laughs> So I hear like, no, I mean, it, it's, it's just food for thought. So you know what? We're going to take a quick break. Up next, the great circumcision debate continues. Two leading doctors go toe-to-toe -to -toe on the issue. Plus, we're going to meet a man who knows firsthand both sides of the issue. He got circumcised at 37. You all want to hear what he has to say, don't you? Yeah. Hell yeah! We'll be right back. Welcome back. As we mentioned at the top of the show, the American Academy of Pediatrics is taking a stance that the benefits of circumcision outweighs the risks. But this stance is by no means unanimous. In fact, it has divided the medical community. Our next guests are doctors on opposite sides of the debate. Please welcome Dr. Suzanne Gilbert-Lenz and Jay Gordon. Thank you. Okay. First, full transparency. Suzanne, you also happen to be my very, very good friend. And Dr. Jay Gordon, you happen to be my pediatrician. But let me be clear, Dr. Gordon didn't get to be my pediatrician until my boys were, I don't know, eight or nine years old. So, so you were not involved in any circumcision that may or may not have taken place, okay? <laughs> All right, so Suzanne, let me start with you. You perform circumcisions on newborns. I do, yeah. And, so, and you have a son. You're also I have a son, son and a daughter. So where do you stand on this issue? Well, I mean, I stand like I stand on a lot of things with education and choice. So my feeling is I really understand where both of you guys are coming from. I, I felt exactly the way the two of you did when my son was born. And I'm Jewish, and in our faith, we circumcise on the eighth day. And, you know, that was one of the hardest days of my life. But I do understand where people are coming from. And I don't feel that everybody has to be circumcised. But I also feel that if people want to make that choice for their children, it is their choice to make, and there's evidence to support making that decision. And Dr. Gordon, I mean, are you entirely convinced that this is better, healthier for the baby to be circumcised? Oh, definitely not. Definitely not. The, the statement from the American Academy of Pediatrics said that the, the benefits outweigh the risks. The second paragraph went on to say that the health benefits are not sufficient to recommend this for all healthy right. newborn babies, but they are sufficient to require third-party reimbursement. This was a recommend. Nothing has changed regarding circumcision this year or in the past hundred years. What's changed is that the insurance companies have become reluctant to reimburse doctors Correct. three, four, five hundred dollars. So the American Academy of Pediatrics, looking out for their own, has said, "Well, it's it's good enough for insurance companies to pay." And here's the <laughs> thing: if you come from a low-income family and you're in one of the 18 states in this country that Medicaid won't pay for a circumcision, you don't have a choice now. So. That, I have a problem with that because it becomes a status thing. I, I don't even know about status. I mean, maybe it's a status thing, but I think if you're from a family that is on public assistance and you want your child circumcised, you believe that this is the right thing to do and you believe that this child maybe has greater risk, you now can't get the circumcision because you, you can't pay out of pocket 
to get a circumcision. Your insurance company is not going to cover it. Can I ask how much it is? Just uh, it's not. I mean, listen. I'm not. A, first of all, a member of the American Academy of Pediatrics. I'm an OBGYN. Yes, but, but you it's, do these. I do do these. <laughs> we get paid not that much, like 100, 150. Hundred dollars. No. Okay, uh -huh. that's what's yes, Jay. But for someone who's on <laughs> <laughs> but for Insurance. someone who's on public assistance, I mean, that's that's a lot of money. Oh, it's a huge amount of money. Right. There's no, they, we don't have equal access to medical care. We don't. We, <laughs> parents don't even have equal access to advice about to the information. In other Correct. words, if someone thinks that perhaps circumcision is not a good idea, uh, odds are very good that almost any pediatrician they talk to is going to counsel in favor of circumcision right now. But Jay, we've gone from 80% mm -hmm. circumcision rate in this country in the late 70s, early 80s to like 50%. About so. So, I mean, I, you're right that a lot of people are really conservative. You and I lament about our colleagues frequently that they don't take the time to listen and to talk. Mm -hmm. But something is shifting and changing. People yeah, are getting this shifting? information. Is it about... Uh, is it, about, is it a monetary thing? I don't or know. There are I cultural don't know. shifts. Oh, I, th I, think I think it's think cultural. People, I, I think, think people cultural. realize that it, yeah. it is, it, it, it's, never, it's never been the greatest idea in the world to cut anything off a baby boy that he might want later on in life. Okay? I mean, that's... And, and, and now, now everybody should have equal access to good advice. And whether or not they have equal access to third-party reimbursement, at the very least, they should be able to sit down with a doctor who mm -hmm. respects their point of view. Yeah. I mean... In the so Jewish religion, it's 6,000 years, and, and, and that's a discussion that's quite difficult. In other families, it's, I want my son to look just like me. And my response is that for at least 13 years, unless he's a weird little kid, he's not going to look that much like me. <laughs> so wait, can uh, we talk about so, the baby boy? Can we talk about the procedure and the, and the pain? Is there, there obviously is pain involved. This is really, really important. We, our, our governing body came down more than a decade ago very strongly on this. And anesthesia is to be used. So we use numbing cream first. This is what I do, and this is what I hope all my colleagues do. It's probably not the case. But you use numbing cream first. And so that's kind of a superficial, and then uh, injectable lidocaine, like when you go to the dentist. Yeah, the hygiene thing. What's about, are they cleaner when they're, when they're cut? And, and no, it's, they're not cleaner, but when you're doing a urine culture on a baby who's not circumcised, you might not get a completely bacteria-free sample. So there may be overdiagnosis of UTIs. Now, there's no question that when you gather data in somewhere where there may be medical difficulties, some parts of Africa, circumcision may diminish the rate of HIV transmission. Well, wait, that may. There's really compelling evidence. Right, but there's also compelling evidence that the, the, the rate of complications in Nigeria, which is the latest study, for, is very high. And education and condoms, not not okay, and we'll talk about HPV more later, yes, I think. Yes, we are. But HPV is not condom resistant 100%, so I don't want to jump ahead too much. But I, no. this is a tough one. Yeah, it is, it is. No, and what about our couple here? They're eight months pregnant. If, if, if they were your patient, how would you talk them through this? I would talk them through it the way I talk my patients through any other procedure. And I would tell them the risks the benefits and the alternatives. And leave it up to them and, to yes. decide. They, and they, already, they always they ask me this, what I do and what I did, and I tell them that this is an intensely personal choice, and you have to look at what you think is going to be best for your family. And this is a big ticket item. I am not denying that. I'm and not it's denying at this that. precious time when they are about to have oh, their yeah. child. Yeah. Now let's meet a man who can give us both sides. He's basically the man of the hour. He's going to talk personal experience. Please welcome Hugo Schwitzer. You got a little swing in your step. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so you were uncircumcised until the age of 37. You right. made the decision. Why at that age? Well, really, there were two reasons. Uh, one thing we haven't talked about as a possible consideration for circumcision is that, as most people know, when you're having sex, the foreskin retracts. And what can happen, especially if you're having sex without a condom, is that the foreskin can roll back very fast and very painfully. Uh, and when I was in college, I had a sexual experience that sent me to the emergency room and gave me five stitches. So that was the first sign that... Well, you know, I can't help but get a visual of what you must have been doing to end up in the emergency room. <laughs> well, I, I want to be—I want to be clear that it wasn't, you know, something really kinky. That would have, you know, there were no there were no blades involved. It was, you know, it was it was basic intercourse between a man and a woman. Um, the doctors would know this as, as frenular tearing, and obviously, you know, different men have different 
uh, levels of, it's not the medical term, uh, retractability, and maybe mine was a little less retractable than some others. But I've talked to other guys over the years who've also had trouble with this. And after this first experience of you know, going to the emergency room, which was painful and humiliating, uh, <laughs> after that first experience, I you know, spent many, many years afterwards often being very anxious, very worried. You know, is it going to happen again? Is it going to happen again? So that was Which one. is kind of a bummer when you want to be sexually active and yeah, be free it, it, to always have that in the back of, the mo of your absolutely. mind. Absolutely. You know, and, and you develop little, you know, little tricks and techniques. What happens is that you, were, you have to be constantly aware. Whereas, as a circumcised man, uh, that you know, constant vigilance isn't necessary. So, okay, so you are married, right? Yes. So your wife has got to, got to experience both sides of you. Yep. Um, and so how is it different? What was the procedure like? We all are dying to know. Was it painful? Uh, is there discomfort? You bet. I, I will say I've, I've broken an arm and I've passed a kidney stone, and, this, and those were both much worse. And if you've ever broken a bone or, you know, uh, passed a kidney stone or had other things. Um, or had a baby. Or had a baby. And I've watched my wife give birth, and, and my pain wouldn't even, you know, be anywhere. It was, it was nothing compared to that. Okay, um, and how is the recovery? The recovery, I mean, it's just really quickly, it's a, it's a procedure where, it's, and I don't know how every doctor does this, I had it done by a urologist, outpatient. Uh, they numb uh, the penis in two places. Uh, this is for an adult circumcision, not for a child. Uh, right at the base of the penis, and then right around the head of the penis. Ow! Uh, and it was done with a laser, not a scalpel. Uh, we learn something new every day, don't we, people? <laughs> and you learned it on the Ricky Lake Show. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> So, so how long has it been since you had that procedure? Uh, that was uh, eight years ago. And so no regrets? No regrets at all. I mean, it's, I mean uh, in terms of my sex life with my wife, without going into details, you know, too many details. Oh, please do. Or, well, I, can, I can tell you, uh, even if she weren't eventually going to see this, this is the best sex of my life. Uh, and... <laughs> You know, and the real. And you have a son. I know you have a son. Did you choose to circumcise him? I did choose to circumcise my son. Yeah, uh, and partly, you know, and there we we can get into some of the reasons for that. But the one point that that I really wanted to make sure I got in was there's this myth that there's this dramatic loss of sensation that circumcised men have. That yes, a man I've who was circumcised that. as a little boy is somehow going to go through his entire life missing out on something. Uh, and having had plenty of experience both ways, I can assure anybody there is there's no noticeable reduction in sensation. Really, right. I mean, it's, if it's a, if it was at a level ten before, it's at a level ten now. That's really good to hear. I really appreciate you sharing your story. I know it's very personal. You have such a great sense of humor about it. So I really, Hugo, I thank you for being here. We're going to take a quick break. Coming up, psychosexual therapist and Loveline host Simone Bien breaks down the sensual and sexual side of circumcision. You don't want to miss this. We have one boy. What did you guys decide? She basically asked me, what do you want to be done? I said, circumcise him, you know? Well, do you mind if I ask, does he match his father? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. The presentation was important. Between you and me and everybody out there, <laughs> is your husband circumcised? <laughs> From you. Well, I was wondering whether women want to say something about this. Do we prefer circumcised or uncircumcised? Well, do you? Well, do you? I prefer circumcised, 100%. Okay, can I ask why? Well, hygiene, sensitivity, uh, the way it feels, the way it looks, it's just, it's just much... <laughs> Cleaner, nicer, healthier, simpler. Okay, well, I've actually, I've heard the opposite. I've heard that it's been more pleasurable for women who, with men who are uncircumcised. Yeah, see? See? Go, go, honey, clap and be proud. So there you have it. Thank you so much for sharing. 70% um, of males in the U.S. are circumcised, so the chances of a woman having experienced an uncircumcised male is pretty low in this country. My friend and host of After Ricky, Josh Sabera, hit the streets to find out just how much people know about the subject. Take a look. What do you think women want? I don't know. Ask a woman. Have you ever asked any? You don't exactly walk up to somebody. <laughs> you would. I would. Yeah, of course you would. I prefer circumcision because, I mean, that's just the norm, I guess. From my experience, I've heard, like, it's 
kind of hot, you know. Well, wait, from your experience you've heard or from your experience you've discovered? From, from what people have told me. Do you have boys? We have one boy. And what did you guys decide? She basically asked me, what do you want to be done? I said, circumcise him, you know. Well, do you mind if I ask, does he match his father? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. The presentation was important. Between you and me and everybody out there, <laughs> Is your husband circumcised? <laughs> I was a child that was not circumcised, and then at the age of six, I had a, I had it done. So all of a sudden, you go from a turtleneck to a V-neck overnight. <laughs> yes. All right. Here to help us answer some common questions is the co-host of Love Line with Dr. Drew Pinsky and my friend. Please welcome psychosexual therapist Simone Bien. <laughs> I'm so happy you're here, and I know you are European. Well, yes, yes, you're from the UK. <laughs> but um, and I know it's it's not the norm there to be circumcised. No, it isn't. So um, actually, what is familiar to a lot of Europeans is men who are intact. So for us, when we yes, that's see the term. That's a the word intact. It makes you laugh, but yeah. intact. That's the word. <laughs> intact, darling. So when we see a circumcised penis, um, as beautiful as they are, that becomes unfamiliar to us but then of course it's the same Ricky you get to know the penis of the man you love whether he's intact or circumcised what are some of the common myths we've talked about a lot of them today okay one a huge big myth is that men who are intact are dirty well let me ask all the women here and I'm going to ask you Ricky as well Colin Firth do you imagine he's dirty I don't think so. Colin Firth, I'm guessing he is intact. I mean, he's hot, but he's I kind of think he might be, not, not necessarily dirty down there, but he's kind of like a dirty guy, right? but, Yeah, dirty as like in a dirty hot. hot guy. Yeah, exactly, but not dirty unclean. And the point is, look, if a guy doesn't know how to wash himself, my goodness, then you are not going to want to be with this guy. Not just because he's lazy, because two years into the relationship, he ain't going to be doing the dishes either. And that is not good enough for any of us women. Okay, so what are some other myths? Um, and Another myth is that if it's intact, it can really freak somebody out. Well, again, it's what is familiar. We can't judge somebody, you know, on whether they have a hood or not a hood. It's, we have to just get used to it. And of course, in America, it's interesting when you were saying 70% of men up to a certain point were circumcised. Of course, that's going to be what is most familiar. But Every single man is individual. We know that. Men sitting in the audience know that. So we've just got to get to know the person, the penis, and that is part of, you know, a loving, wonderful relationship. Come on, we all know that sex isn't just all about the physical. It is about the intimacy, the emotion. It's the love, the closeness. A good lover makes us feel safe so that we can explore, so that we can be all those wonderful things together. It's, so it, That's yeah. all very, very true. I love the giggling that's going on, and all I, 